It's a great pleasure to be joined by David Roberts, CBE. David is an 11-time Paralympic gold medalist and eight-time world champion. Uh, David, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much, Hart. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so, born in the Rhonda Valleys, uh, tell me a little bit about your life growing up, I guess. Um, well, born in the Valleys, I was um, uh, either expected to go to the mines or play rugby. Much to my father's disgust, I didn't either. And, um, <laughs> uh, decided that I wanted to do a different way with my life. So um, uh, swimming was, for me, a form of physiotherapy that uh, became an obsession slash lifestyle. And it's something that I'm forever grateful. But coming from the valleys made me who I am. It's made me it's made me humble, it's made me honest, and it's made me fight for everything I have, as I've come from a place where you have to. Yeah, perfect. Um, so I'm right in thinking that it, it was at 11 years old that you were diagnosed or, or told that you had cerebral palsy. Um, I, I've heard some things where, you, where you've talked about before that your teachers had just told you you were clumsy. Um, how did that feel as an 11 year old boy to, to be told that? Um, I think I have one real abiding memory of this and it was obviously at 10 and 11 you go to comprehensive school and I remember me and my parents being called into a meeting by my headmaster at the time to be told that because of my disability maybe it would be better if I stayed back for two years for two years until I was ready which my parents completely refused there was absolutely no reason to keep me back so they didn't so for me it was it was kind of it was a struggle but it was more of a struggle because people didn't really know what was wrong they always thought that it was my mum being overprotective it was me just being clumsy it wasn't it wasn't until 11 that we had the the label to sort of justify what my mother was saying and say that actually you know what Mothers know. My mother knew something wasn't quite right, so uh, it was good. But yeah, that, that was a disappointing. It was disappointing, and it was really annoying because all my friends were going to comprehensive school, and we were all excited. And then all of a sudden, I'm being told, "No, you're not good enough. You're not going to go." It made me more determined, so I went with all my friends, and I studied as normal. It was there were no issues. There were no barriers. Only barriers that people put in front of me. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was something I was just going to build upon from what you've said. Was it? Before you were you were told by a doctor uh, that that this head teacher had said that to you, or was that after you'd, uh, I guess, it was acquired after. this label? Yeah, it was after. It was after, after because then he felt more justified in having that label. So he felt it was it was it was an easier thing to do. But to me, I, I guess it was it was the early nineties, and yeah, I think the world is a very different place now to how it was back then. And I just yeah. don't don't think he had the understanding. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would say that uh, things have come a long way, but there, there is still probably a long way to go. Oh, absolutely. We've only scratched the surface of where we need to be. Yeah. But from when I was growing up, we've moved an awful long way. Yes, I can imagine. Um, so you, you sort of touched on already how you ended up in swimming. Uh, I, I've heard you talk about the story before, but just for people who are watching now, um, do you want to just go into a bit more detail on how, how that actually came about? Uh, basically, I think my father wanted a lifeguard. So my, my dad could never swim. My mother could never swim. So I think secretly they wanted a lifeguard. So my dad decided that when he when my dad was growing up in school, you had the children that could swim would have swimming lessons and the children that couldn't were left in the shallow end on their own. And my dad was determined that that wasn't going to happen to me. So uh, he very wisely or unwisely took me with his best friend to the local swimming baths and threw me into the water. And thankfully for him, I came back up. Otherwise, we talk, we're talking about my dearly beloved father. But uh, luckily for him, I came back to the surface and uh, I swam ever since. So for me, it was, it was literally sink or swim. And I decided that I would swim. And my life never changed. So I swam my first 25 meters when I was 18 months old. And that was all down to my father being determined that he was going to throw me in the water and that I wasn't going to be seen as different. Well, it's a, uh, it a good job it was uh, swim and not sing because we wouldn't be here today <laughs> otherwise. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I'm just interested to know, so obviously you said when you went to comprehensive school, 
uh, a head teacher had already put a barrier head in, in front of you. Yep. Um, did you enjoy or, or try to participate in any other sports and were there barriers that you noticed then? Yes, absolutely. So growing up, I used to play mini rugby, then junior rugby, because when you're born in Wales, you play rugby. That's what you do. Yes. Uh, it, got, it got to when I was 11 or 12, and I was a little bit smaller than the boys that I grew up with. And a lot of the parents actually spoke to my coach and suggested that maybe because of me being smaller and disabled, I shouldn't play rugby. And uh, that was that was kind of strange, but I was very fortunate that um, uh, my rugby coach at the time, who unfortunately is no longer with us, um, a guy called um, Eric Anthony, he was fantastic. He sat me down and he said, look, if you want to play rugby, play rugby. But I hear you're a swimmer and you're a good one. Why aren't you doing that? And he was right. He made me look at myself and go, you know what? Yeah, maybe I should not be playing rugby. Maybe I don't need to be doing this. My friends were still my friends. It's just I didn't play rugby with them. So in that respect, the, the little bit of discrimination I encountered, I managed to turn into a positive by having an understanding coach and someone who, who decided to talk to me at a level that he understood. I think, yeah, I think that's really interesting to hear you say, because fast forward now to 2020, uh, and I, I actually work in a primary school at the moment, um, and that there is children in there with, with disabilities and we'll do, we'll have a lesson, let's say on gymnastics and they'll say, oh, Mr. Knight, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to, to do this. And I'm like, <laughs> obviously I've grown up with a disabled mother. So that is at the top of my list of priorities to make sure this child can participate and they do not feel left out. That's perfect. That's what you should do. I mean, try everything. I, my comprehensive school was fantastic. It was it was an amazing sporting school. So I think through my school that have been three Olympic champions, five, 11 British Lion rugby players, six Welsh rugby captains. So it was a very, I was very fortunate to go to, go to, to such a sporting school. And they were brilliant with me. I, I played rugby for school, I played football for school. I swam, I did everything that I wanted to do. And I was encouraged to. The, the, the sports staff within the school were fantastic and they, they really gave me all the encouragement I needed to just be normal and to enjoy my life. That's great to hear. Um, so obviously being from South Wales or just Wales, there's a, you've already said there's a bit of a social pressure to, to play rugby. Absolutely. What, what do you think tipped you towards swimming more? Was it your ability, your, your personality or...? To be perfectly honest, I was horrible. I was horrible at rugby. I just no, it was just I, yeah, I was never going to be a rugby player. I was I was a hundred percent committed and I would run around all day, but yeah, I was yeah, I was I was not that good. And swimming was something that was natural to me. It was something that I never had to think about. I was always as quick as everybody I swam with, sometimes quicker. And it was easy. I never had to concentrate. Rugby was something that I used to have to really concentrate and I used to get hurt so often and I used to I used to find it harder and harder to bounce back from getting hurt. And in the end, it was an easy decision. Yeah. Yeah, that's understandable. Uh, so fast forward a little bit from, I guess, school. Uh, so your first major competition uh, for Great Britain would have been the European Championships, Germany, 1999? Yeah, yeah it, quite, it uh, went quite well. It went quite well. That's good to know. <laughs> I think most of your major competitions went quite quite well looking at the uh, accolades you've acquired yeah, um, certainly did. the step up to the european stage the, the global stage what what was that like um in terms of facilities swimming pools um all of that a uh, completely different world completely different world we went i went from swimming at my local swimming club that I was very fortunate that they allowed me to swim as a, I was the first disabled swimmer to ever swim in their main squads and they were great, but I went from swimming in a 25 meter pool six times a week to swimming in Olympic sized pools with athletes that were professional, the athletes that were lottery funded, athletes that were full-time swimmers and I was better than most of them and I was as knowledgeable as all of them and it was it was amazing for me and I, I didn't feel any pressure because I always believed I was going to win. Every time I raced, there was never a there was never a doubt that I was going to win. 
so for me it was it was fun it was it was a chance to prove that me being there wasn't luck and that i deserved to be there i didn't expect it to go half as well as it did but it did you know i did four races i broke four world records four gold medals you know that's the dream start to any career yeah i mean it, it couldn't go much better than that could it no it's pretty good it was <laughs> as, as beginnings go it wasn't a bad one uh so would you say i i know i've heard you in the past put it more as a label like you are you um having cerebral palsy is like a label would you say that label absolutely I'm me I, my disability has no effect on my life or who i am i'm me and i will always be known as me i'm known as a swimmer and that's it i don't ever want to be known as that disabled swimmer or that person with cerebral palsy because i don't see myself as that i see myself as a normal person i drive a normal car i've got a house i've got two children i lead a normal life i just happen to have a disability yeah. but it doesn't define me would you say having that disability would, would growing up and, and going to these competitions was it ever did it ever frustrate you that people would would maybe treat you differently absolutely you know it, it was always the it was always it was always the we, we were the we were the after party we were always the 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 the, the other so, you know, when we do competitions, they would, when they started doing um, uh, disability inclusive swimming within the able bodied competitions, we were always the last event and there was nobody there. And that was, that was kind of disheartening to begin with. But, you know, eventually they cottoned on and we became part of the Commonwealth Games and we became, we became something very real and we were involved in mainstream and we swam at the, you know, at the same time as the, as the able bodied athletes. And for me, that was amazing and it was something that I never imagined would happen but when we got to Melbourne and my final was immediately after one of my great Australian swimming heroes he just won gold the place was amazing and I was in the same competition it was it was just an amazing amazing feeling to realize that actually disability sport was really being taken seriously and we were suddenly we were suddenly there I think my favorite story of all is um when I realized how much of an impact we made as disabled athletes was in uh, in Sydney, in my first games, there were there was a one hour highlight show at six o'clock in the evening, the same time as the Simpsons. And there were people actually writing to writing emails to say to me that their children were watching the Power Olympics instead of the Simpsons. And for the first time ever, we were bigger than the Simpsons, and that was pretty cool. That is yeah, that is a pretty uh, big milestone. <laughs> Absolutely, it was huge to think that people wanted, they wanted to watch us and they, they were fascinated by what we were doing and we were winning and, you know, it was, it, it was a real, it was a real milestone for me in disability sport and it's only got bigger and better. Yeah, I, I think for me it's always baffled me that people haven't shown an interest because obviously growing up in a home with my disabled mother and the Paralympics were always as big, if not bigger in our house than than the Olympics, Absolutely. and I, I remember growing up watching you, uh, watching Dame Sarah Story now, Ellie Ellie Simmons. That they were, they were people that I aspired, aspired, uh, inspired me. Not wasn't just always your Usain Bolt, Michael Phelps. Of, of, of course, they're phenomenal athletes, but Absolutely. the playing field was the exact same for me. I think that's great. I think that is, but I think that is great credit to your mother for bringing you up to appreciate all sports and not just the fact that we were disabled it was sport and I think that's that's an amazing thing and for me when I was competing all of my friends they they, they were right behind me you know when we were competing in Beijing and Australia they'd be up till the early hours of the morning jumping around screaming then going to work and it was great and you know it, I'm lucky that being Welsh we do love sport we do love people that do well and even to this day now whenever I go home my wife can never understand that People stop me who don't know me and will talk to me and ask how I am and how are things and how are my children and when am I going to swim again and how do I feel? And it's really great to think that that's happened because people now understand and we became, the Paralympics became a huge monster and people suddenly understood that we weren't, we weren't just human beings. We, we were athletes and we were not disabled athletes we were athletes in our own right and we could do things that most people watching could never do yeah for sure um so 
keeping on the like uh, line of these major competitions and the Paralympics. So three Paralympics, uh, 11 gold medals, three silvers, two bronzes. Close, what? 11. 11 gold, four silver, and a bronze. But you were close. Four silver. Sorry, I do apologise. <laughs> no. Um, what was that Paralympic experience like as a whole? The athlete village, the going ar around the world. That was amazing. Amazing. The well, the athlete village had more people living there than the village I grew up in. So that was that was huge for me for a start. Yeah. Just it was unbelievable, and just to be able to eat whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted. You know, everything you can ever imagine the Olympics to be, it is, and it's bigger. And it was just the best feeling in the world. You felt like a rock star. You see that Olympic flame lit, and you see Kylie Minogue on stage, and you think to yourself, well, you know, I've made it. I've made it, and particularly, you know, in Australia, there were 19,000 people in the stadium, and it was full every single day. Heat sand finals, it was full. I've never competed in front of that many people. And for me, it was just, it was mind boggling to think that these people came to watch us swim. And I was very, I was humbled by it, but for me, I was just doing my job. So I was there to win and that's all I wanted to do, but it was, it was just brilliant. And it's just so hard to describe the Olympic village, the Paralympic village is like no one else on earth because everybody's able and everybody is just, it's common to see a, a train of wheelchairs just going down the middle of the street with the cars trying to get around them and people hopping around and it was just it was just bizarre and it was you really felt at home it felt so so comfortable and it was still you know one of the greatest experiences of my life to walk into the olympic village and just go wow look at this place it's huge and you just feel like rock stars and that's that's the craziest thing it's and you meet people that you would never expect to meet and you do things that you would never expect. In Sydney, uh, my parents had never flown before and they flew all the way to Sydney to see me. So that was huge for them. It's a big moment, yeah. I won, I won my first gold medal mm -hmm. and obviously I wanted to go to see my parents and they were right up in the nosebleeds, right at the very top of the stadium. So I decided I was going to go and see my parents. So I walked through the crowd to get up to my parents and there was a there was a young Australian boy and he must have been five or six with his mum and she stopped me. I said, "Oh, we watched your race." Was I beaten Australian who was the favourite to win? So they were slightly disappointed and happy. So that they wanted a they wanted a folk tale. I said, "Oh, can we have a folk tale with your medal?" I said, "Yeah, no problem." I put my medal on the little boy. He had a folk tale, and she said, "Oh, can I take your address?" And I never thought anything of it, so I give him an email address and I thought, "Ah, whatever." And it was only. When I got back home, maybe three, four weeks after I got back home, I had an email from the little boy with a photo to say that he went to school and told all his friends that he'd met me and that they were all really jealous that he'd met an Olympic champion. And then it's hard not to feel like a rock star when things like that happen. Yeah. You know, when I came back from Beijing, I was on the front page of the, the Welsh, the South Wales National Paper, going to collect my dog from the kennels. And it was just really bizarre. You know, my dog had been in the kennels for eight weeks and I went to collect it and the press were there waiting for me and it was just a really strange really strange experience but it was fun yes it is it's very <laughs> fun and it's nice to know those little moments with just a, a picture with a boy they're, they, they're the ones that really stick with you and yeah they're the best they're the best the 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 medals the parties they're wonderful but the real people you meet along the way they're the ones that mean the most to you when you meet someone who who wants to be just like you, who wants to be better than you, who wants to do everything that you've done, who just get excited to watch you. That's the greatest thing. When you're stopped in Cardiff by a little old lady who says, you know, I sat my alarm for four o'clock in the morning just to watch you race and you won and then I couldn't go back to sleep. And they, that's amazing. That's amazing. This is just a little old lady who doesn't know me, who's never met me, but just wanted to be part of my story. And that's just it's bonkers for me to think that I used to do that. I used to watch the Olympics and I used to stay up and watch my heroes and then to think that suddenly people are looking at me as one of those. And I'll never get my head around that. Yeah. Um, so all, all these major competitions, obviously, the European Championships, World Championships, Commonwealth Games, Paralympics. Uh, I'm just interested to know, is, is there any scenarios of arisen of where you or your peers have, have faced barriers um, 
while while at those competitions. Um, hmm. that's, that's good. It's, it's, it's a really good question. Um, there are always barriers in every competition. There are barriers that are, whether it be logistics, whether it be transport, whether it be environment. I think the one thing that we can be very fortunate that as British swimming athletes is we were lottery funded and we were very well looked after. So we had the best of everything. We had the best doctors, the best physios, best hotels. We had the best flights. So I think we we were actually very fortunate that we were we were incredibly well looked after. I mean, there's always there's always illness, there's always injury. I remember, you know, one of the hardest things I think that we have to deal with was um, it, back in Sydney. You know, my my uh, we did the relay. Uh, with a guy called Mark Woods, whose father died uh, not long before we'd got there. And it was amazing to see that someone would be able to compete and have the strength to be able to compete, knowing that that would happen. And when we won gold, we did the interview and he said that, you know, this was for my dad. And it was just, it was phenomenal to think that even through personal hardship, you do whatever you can to win. And he really did. And yeah, I mean, in terms of in terms of barriers for us as British athletes, now we were very lucky. Other countries certainly have much harder, much adding much harder than us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so there was an old interview of yours. Um, must be about ten years old. The interview, um, and there was a quote where you said the London Paralympic Games could could make or break disability sport in this country. Absolutely. Um, I was just interested to see how, how you thought that had aged. Um, yeah. I, I, was, I think I was dead right. I think it made, I think it made a similar sport. You only need to look at, I mean, I live in Sweden right now, but I still, I still have contact with the UK and you can see that Holly Arnold is now on I'm a, I'm a Celebrity. You had Lauren Steadman on Strictly and you think, wow, you know, this is ridiculous that they're on there because of the strength of the London Paralympics. And you look at the opportunities to support athletes, they are now very heavily sponsored. They are very well known. The likes of Eleanor Simmons is a household name. You have Dame Sarah's story. You know, it, I think it really was, it was a massive platform. And I think that athletes have done well from it. And I think that it's deserved, you know, that the success is always deserved. But yeah, I think it made it, I think, Having it in London gave the British public the chance to experience what it really is to be a Paralympic athlete, to be in the stadium and to just go crazy and watch people win. And it was, it was, yeah, it was phenomenal to me. It, it made it. That, absolutely. You only have to look at the things that are happening today. And that, you know, someone like Holly Arnold, who I remember as a young girl back in Wales, who was just a small little thing, who's now classed as a, as a, as a real celebrity. As she's on something that'll be watched by millions of people every day. That's cool. That's cool because when I started back in 2000, that would never have happened. Yeah. So it made it for me. So keep, keeping on that uh, trail of thought, on more of like a recreational level, do, do you think the, the games could have done more to, to impact that? I think so. I think that I think that could well be it could be well it could well be a gap that I think that uh, there was there, there is scope there's so much more scope now to really include schools with participating in disability sports. So for example, my brother is a teacher in a primary school and uh, they do a little Paralympic sport day every year. Even though they're all able-bodied, they do a little Paralympic sport day. And I think that would be an opportunity that could have been continued to get children competing in games like boccia and wheelchair basketball and understanding just how phenomenal these athletes are because they are such hard sports to do. And I think in that respect, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe something could have been missed because this was the chance. But you know, time will tell. You know, the of for me, still looking, is time. looking from where, yeah, well, looking from where I started. It's a completely different world now. Yes, that definitely. Um, going more onto things that, that you've done or, or said, um, yeah. you addressed the Human Rights Council in Geneva, Switzerland. 
Um, I did. That was about, about, about London 2012 and uh, human rights for people with disabilities. Uh, I, I'd just love to know what, what was spoken about. What was, um, did you present to them? Or um, it was. It, I went with um, uh, John, Sir John Craven, and it was. It was basically an opportunity to say that you know what Paralympic sport meant to us as athletes, and obviously the opportunities that it, it provides, both in social status and the ability to for some people to escape war-torn countries and to be able to better their lives. You know, a lot of disabled people their entire life are told you can't, you're not good enough. And they're put into a box. And I think the Paralympic movement, particularly London for the UK, put that into a real context is that, you know what, no matter where you're from, no matter what you're told, you could be the very best at what you want to be if you have that, that one little, that one little bit of a drive that makes you want to be, you can. And for me, it was very important to get that message out that the Paralympics is not it's not just the games, it's not just a sporting event, it's a cultural event, it's a social event, it's, it's something bigger. And it's something that gives hope to people that maybe don't have it. And it gives hope to, uh, dare I say, disabled people who, who believe that they're nothing, who believe that society has told them that they're nothing. And it's a chance, it was a chance to say, well, actually, you know what, no, everybody's entitled to whatever they dream of. Doesn't mean you'll achieve your dream. But why should you be stopped from having it because of a disability? And for me, it was a real good opportunity to be able to get that across to people and to say, look, you know what? This is important to me. To me, you know, sport is fantastic, but it's not everything. Sport gives you an opportunity to better your life. But that's only because I had strong people around me my entire life telling me, look, you're not disabled. Forget it. Just move. Get on with your life. And I think that's that that was that was the real message that we try to get across that you know inclusion is everything and the more you include people in society the better society will be as a whole and I, that's I can, really important i can agree more there with you um yeah it's in, interesting to hear you say about that society has told some people with disabilities that they're not good enough to to take part and they, they shouldn't so Absolutely. i guess to overcome that where, where do you I, I know where I think the the first place needs to needs to be looking at is like education but where absolutely. would where would you say education absolutely education uh, teachers are the ones that teach the children that are, that are the future At the end of the day you guys how you present yourselves and how you how you deal with disability and how you see this not just how you deal how you see disability is massively important and it's it's so important that if you have a disabled child in your classroom, you don't treat them any differently. And that is the best message to get across to any able-bodied child anywhere. Is this just a person? It's just the person in your class who gets on with their life. They may have wheels to walk, they may have sticks to walk, they may need a dog to guide them, but they're a person. And for me, that is the most important lesson of all for any child growing up, is that we're all the same. We are all exactly the same. We may be different color, shape, size, ability. Doesn't matter. We're all human beings and we all deserve to be treated with respect. And that starts from teachers and right from a very young age. We have, I have a little four year old boy and a little daughter. Me and my wife are both disabled. My greatest hope in our life is that our children will never know we're disabled because they don't see it, they see us as mum and dad. Our little four-year-old has never once questioned why mum has one leg or why I limp. He just doesn't care. He doesn't see it. He doesn't look at it. We're just mum and dad. And for me, that's the hope that every child looks at you that way. They don't look at anything other than other. That's a person. But that's all we are. Absolutely. Um, we, are, we are running close to our time. Um, I've absolutely loved every second of this. Um, I have some just quick fire questions. Obviously, feel okay. free, to, free to go into more detail on them. Um, proudest, proudest moment as, a, as, a, as an athlete? Uh, proudest moment as an athlete? I, I think probably winning the 11th gold medal, becoming the most successful swimmer. That was a really special moment because a lot of people didn't expect me to win that race. There was a lot of pressure on me. And, the only person that didn't doubt I was going to win was me. 
and it was really nice to win it. Yeah. Uh, next one, uh, biggest biggest role model. Oh, God, there's so many. Biggest role model. It sounds really corny, but probably my parents, because they they never let me be anything other than me. They never let me feel sorry for myself. They never let me dwell on anything. They made sure that I was just me. So yeah, they, they, were, they were real role models. And I guess my rugby coach of all those years ago, who had the courage to say to me, you know what? You suck at rugby, but you're good at something else and really focus on it. So yeah, they, they are two, they, they're probably really big role models in my life. Okay, that's lovely. Um, most starstruck? Oh, most starstruck. I met Jeremy Irons and, okay. uh, and Miley and Class on the same day, and that was pretty cool. But I think meeting Jeremy Irons, uh, I presented a, um, a teaching award in London and um, Jeremy Irons walked into the room and he had a presence of no one I've ever met in my life. He just felt like a very powerful man. And when he walked into the room, he, he was cool. And he was a brilliant, brilliant man. And he wanted to know who I was. And that was brilliant. That's amazing. I am right in thinking you, you did meet Nelson Mandela as well, didn't you? I did, I did yeah. I, I met loads of random people all along the way. I can imagine you did, uh, being on that, that platform. Um, Favourite Paralympic memory? Favourite Paralympic memory? It's probably not a sporting memory. It's more of a it's, it's more of a community memory. Um, in the in the Paralympic village in Sydney, you asked what it was like, and uh, you have like the daily newspaper within the village. And the biggest story was not about sport. It was the fact that the Canadian rugby team's giant inflatable mascot had been stolen and taken hostage. <laughs> and there were there were posters all over the Paralympic village saying that they could have it back for a uh, for a ransom. <laughs> and that was brilliant because it showed that you could still have fun and compete at the same time. That is pretty amusing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then just just final little question: Is it is it true that you? You used to sleep with your Paralympic gold medals under your pillow? Absolutely. You tell me an athlete that didn't, and I, I won't believe they say they didn't. <laughs> it's because it's, the, it's just the most amazing feeling, and you, you don't realize it's real. It doesn't feel real. Nothing about the day feels real. It's only when you fall asleep and wake up 100 times through the night, making sure that it really happened, does it become real. And then you wake up the next morning and you think, okay, life goes on. But for that, for that one night, you feel like, like a rock star right and so. you just don't want it yeah and you just don't ever want it to end so yeah i used to sleep with them frequently it was uh it's just a special thing it's something that that's four years of your life yeah and absolutely there's nothing there's nothing better okay uh that was my final question uh i think we've reached our time uh, i just want to say a huge thank you for joining me again uh, it's been an absolute honor to speak to you um, You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Sharing your insights on your life and and your views on inclusion and stuff. Um, yeah, I, I, it's been a great pleasure, and um, I'd just like to say thank you. No problems. You're very welcome. Perfect.